Hello everyone, welcome to my technical talk today about sequence models. Here's a preview of what's to come. First, we'll talk about how a neural network works, uh, so also known as an RNN. Second, we'll zoom in, about wow, saying zoom while on zoom feels a little bit awkward, but uh, we'll zoom in on the units of RNNs, LSTMs, and GRUs. Last, we'll look at more advanced RNNs, like the bidirectional RNN and deep RNN. So I'm feeling funny, so let's start with a joke explaining why sequence models are useful. A human asks, what do we want? And a computer answers, natural language processing. I don't know about you, but I don't think natural language processing is in the top three things I want right now. Maybe not even my top 10, but anyhow, let's go with it. The human next asks, when do we want it? This is obviously a trick question because humans, even with our relatively long attention spans want everything immediately by this point in the by this point in the conversation the computer has already forgotten what we were talking about and asks when do we want what again so that's the end of the joke i wish zoom had a laugh track or something to play here <laughs> the takeaway here is that a traditional neural network model can't follow dialogue or sequences of text well which is why sequence models were invented The basic sequence model is a recurrent neural network. So we'll start with that one. The GRU, LSTM, BiRNN, and DeepRNN, all of which we will be learning about next, are extensions of this basic RNN architecture. Let's start with an example. Imagine using an RNN for a named entity recognition problem, like recognize whether a word in a sentence is a person's name. In this example, the first word in the sentence or data set would be the input to an RNN. This first word is then passed to a hidden layer. We also pass in an initial vector that's all zero or randomly initialized to the same hidden layer. Inside the hidden layer, math happens and outputs an activation to pass on to the next hidden layer. We'll zoom into the math later when we learn about the recurrent neural unit. Next, multiple parameters are calculated. Then more math happens. And the first word, input vector of zeros, and parameters are used to output a prediction. In the example of named entity recognition, the output would be zero or one. Zero if the word was not, and one if the word was a person's name. The activation and parameters, which includes information about the first word, are then passed into the next hidden layer and are used for predicting whether the second word is the person's name. We repeat this pattern for the third word, and as you can see, a sequence is starting to form. We repeat this pattern for the number of words in the sentence. Alternatively, you can also forcefully stop the sequence model by adding a maximum number of time steps. T can be the number of words or the maximum number of time steps allowed. This is the basic architecture of a neural network. Now we will see how backpropagation and forward propagation works. For every prediction, a loss function calculates the loss. The purpose of this is to optimize the parameter values in this sequence. These losses are propagated forward to inform future output predictions the losses are not only propagated forwards, but also propagated backwards, like this. Now this here is a unit, which is also known as a neuron in the hidden layer. All right, you made it to the first Star Wars GIF. I hope you guys are Star Wars fans because there's more Star Wars GIFs coming up. Next, we'll look at what the math looks like inside one of these recurrent neural units. Here's what the architecture of a unit or neuron inside the hidden layer of an RNN looks like. The activation value from the previous time step and the word vector at the current time step are inputs to the activation function, which is then mapped to zero or one output using softmax before being output as the prediction.
Here's the math showing how the activation at T is calculated before it's passed on to the next hidden layer. G is the tan H activation function and W is the parameter matrix of the previous activation value and the current input value. Lastly, a bias B is added to the output. I know that was a lot of technical details in the last few slides. We're about halfway done. The next half will still be technical, but we'll be talking about higher level differences in the RNN architecture for different use cases. Let's start with an example here. Imagine using an RNN for a sentence generation problem, maybe like the classic write like Shakespeare one, if you're familiar with that. We need to remember the subject of the sentence to decide whether to generate a plural or singular verb next. GRUs or GRUs are better at this than RNNs. GRUs are used in place of RNN units in RNNs. This makes GRUs not only better at understanding longer range dependencies, but also solves RNN's vanishing gradient problem, which I'll talk more about at the end of this video uh, or at the end of this webinar. The GRU is made up of the memory cell, which memorizes relevant information and two gates. First, the update gate decides what information should be memorized or forgotten. And second, the reset gate decides how much of the past information to forget. That was the way a GRU works. The same idea of gates from GRUs are also used in LSTMs, which we'll be learning about next. LSTMs, like GRUs, learn long-term dependencies in a sequence. LSTMs have three gates, so that's one more than a GRU. The LSTM is made up of a memory cell which memorizes relevant information and three gates. First, the forget gate decides what information should be memorized or forgotten. Second, the input gate updates the memory cell if the information is relevant. And third, the output gate decides what the next hidden state should be. Using an LSTM, you can develop a neural network that understands more complex sequences of text. It's hard to predict whether a GRU or LSTM will perform better, so it's often best to try both. Coming up next are bi-directional RNNs, which are bi-directional like this lightsaber here. Bi-directional RNNs let you use information from the beginning and the end of a sequence. Let's think back to the example of named entity recognition. Sometimes you need context from not only before, but also after the word to decide whether the word is a person's name. The one directional RNN only has forward recurrent layers and reads the sentence from left to right. A bidirectional RNN has forward and backward recurrent layers, allowing it to read from left to right and right to left. As a result, this model uses the past, present, and future information when making a prediction. By the way, the A hidden layers here that you see can include traditional RNN, GRU and LSTM units. That was a bi RNN thinking forwards and backwards. Now let's talk about how to take all RNNs, LSTMs, and GRUs and construct deep versions of them. The RNN, GRU, and LSTM you've learned about so far already work well as is, but sometimes math stacking multiple layers of RNNs together to build deeper versions of these models perform better. Here's the standard RNN that you've seen so far. Then we can just stack more layers on top. Now this is a new network with three hidden layers. By the way, these hidden layers don't need to use the simple RNN units we saw at the beginning of today's talk. They can also use GRU and LSTM units. And if you were wondering, it's possible to build a deep version of the bidirectional RNN too. Now that you know how RNNs, GRUs, and LSTMs work, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of these options. 
The traditional RNN, also known as a vanilla RNN, is a good model to start with because it gives you a good baseline to compare the other models with it. However, RNNs often face vanishing gradients problems. This is when the gradient diminishes dramatically as it's propagated backwards. The error might be so small that it might have little effect by the time it reaches the layers close to the input of the model, which is why it's aptly named the vanishing gradients problem. The groove fixes this problem because its gates control the flow of information inside the network more effectively. But there's a trade-off between the speed and power of, net of the network for GRUs and LSTMs. While GRUs can be better at longer sequences because of its additional gate, it's still slower than the GRU. Because bi-RNNs use information from the past, present, and future, which is a good thing because it gives the model more context, you need access to the whole sequence of data before you can make predictions anywhere. So it's a double-edged sword. This can be inconvenient, for example, when you're building a speech recognition system, since you will have to wait for the person to, you know, stop talking before you can make a prediction. It's still a good option for most natural language processing applications where you have access to the whole sentence at once. Deep RNN's hierarchy of hidden layers enables more complex understanding of the data, but it's also more computationally expensive than other options. So that's all the pros and cons, folks. Congratulations, you've now added the RNN, recurrent neural unit, GRU, LSTM, by RNN, and deep RNN to your toolbox to use when creating sequence models. I'm looking forward to seeing what you build using these new tools. Thank you all for listening. My name is Pooja Pujarajan. I'm a deep learning engineer at Node and the USA Ambassador for Women in AI. Follow me on Twitter and check out my website and feel free to follow up and say hi. Thanks, Pooja. That was great. I'm gonna drop it. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to drop your Twitter in the chat just in case people want to follow you. Okay, I'll stop um, sharing then. Cool. Uh, we have some questions. So someone asked, how do you think about how many layers to build? Uh, can you repeat the question? How do you think about how many layers to build? So how many layers in your network? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's honestly trial and error. I start with the simplest just because I want the fastest output, right? If you start with something that's like unnecessarily like 100 layers deep, it's just taking you longer to iterate. So I usually start with one, two, and kind of go up from there. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a sidebar though, I also look to see whether someone else has kind of created something similar online um, because you can learn a lot from other people's experiments. Like, depending on what type of model you're trying to build. Because at that point, you know, you don't want to try rerunning or you don't always want to rerun something that someone's already done. So if you know that like, you know that you'll need at least 10 layers for your particular problem, then you can start there based on previous research. That's a, uh, that's a great suggestion. So Ashi asks, uh, can you share some links um, where I can begin to learn about NLP, so blogs or anything else. Also, I'm going to drop this, uh, uh, this blog post is by Andre Karpathy, and he talks about how to start from a really small model and build it out, slowly add layers and stuff. I highly recommend reading yes, this if you I want to see that. Definitely check it out, guys. Um, uh, but sorry, the question was, uh, what are your favorite resources to learn about NLP? To learn about NLP, hmm, okay. Ooh, a good one is this blog called ruder.io. So R-U-D-E-R.io. It's not my blog, I wish it was. Uh, but it's, it's Sebastian Ruder's blog. He's a NLP scientist and he has some really good writing on um, natural language processing. But just to get started, I, I recommend checking out um, just, there's like an NLP video, I think by, uh, there's definitely one by Andrew Ning on, on sequence models. I really recommend that one. It, it should be on Coursera. Okay. Uh, Charles, if you can drop that link for us, uh, that would be great. Thanks. So Charles. someone asked, uh, 
will any uh, will uh, when would you actually implement a model from scratch would you ever do that yeah um again it depends on your use case uh my philosophy is usually you can use something that already exists to get you maybe like 80 90% of the way um it's definitely a lot cheaper time wise because you can get it going much faster but let's say you need to um add some customization to it let's say you're working in a really novel space where it's a really specific problem that a generalized model won't work for. Or another example more recently that I faced was I was trying to add model interpretability capabilities. So that's like um, integrated ga gradients. Uh, check out PyTorch Captum if you haven't heard of it. But basically, it's it makes it difficult to make your models interpretable if you're using someone else's architecture and you can't really add in the extra math or the extra explainability features. Uh, so actually, this is a good time to tell you guys, Pusha is actually going to do a whole series. So this is her first talk, but she's going to be doing <laughs> two more talks at the next two salons about machine learning explainability. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely come to the next ones. I'm trying to see if there's more questions. Uh, what loss functions are effective for uh, these kinds of networks? Uh, the loss function also kind of depends on your use case. Uh, it's a bit tough to say. A classic kind of starter one that if you're if you're not familiar like what to use at all, I recommend just going with the um, like I don't know. I guess it really depends on your use case, but maybe like cross entropy is like a good one for some things. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to penalize mm -hmm. and how much you're trying to penalize um it so that's a really broad question <laughs> i'm not sure uh, lavanya do you know any resources off the top of your head for just like comparing and contrasting loss functions yes uh i will drop it in i'd have to look to my notes there's a really this guy he does the uh, deepest dives on these like basic parts of neural networks that most people don't pay attention to uh, but i'll yeah. drop that in. um i think those are all the questions uh We'll see you again next week, I guess. I'm super excited. Yeah, thanks for having me here, guys.